while Vermont's legislature has pursued many efforts over recent years to begin to identify and address implicit bias, recognition of the urgency of this work has grown, particularly related to law enforcement. In response, the legislature is considering ideas on how police practices in the state should change, including policies on use of force, citizen oversight, use of body cameras, hiring and training of police officers, and other relevant issues. We recognize there is much more work our state and nation need to do in recognizing and mitigating systemic racism beyond policing policy. We are committed to continuing a deeper dialogue with Vermonters about that work, and we will look for your participation in future conversations. I will now like to introduce Representative Sarah Copeland Hanses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Grad. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us today to give input into the work in front of us in August and September. Since I will be facilitating the meeting today, I wanted to share a few quick expectations uh, and logistics. This is the first opportunity for the Vermont legislature to hold a virtual public hearing, and we're going to do our best to ensure that this Zoom format gives the public, the committees, and other members of the legislature the same opportunities to participate as if we were physically present at the State House. Just as if we were in the chamber, there are members of the Judiciary and Government Operations Committees who are here at the Zoom table. Uh, we will call up registered participants one by one to share two minutes of testimony. As always, we're happy to have you share your written remarks if you're unable to get to all of your points in the allotted time. You can send written remarks to the committees via the legislative website on either committee page. Uh, lastly, you, will, you only see the panelists here as members of these two committees. However, there are many members of the legislature who have been following these issues closely and are watching today via YouTube. Now a few moments on the expectations for the hearing. Um, I will be calling for the same decorum as if we were physically present in the State House. That means no signs or posters, no profanity or abusive language. Each participant will be required to identify themselves via Zoom, um, and we have that uh, happening at, as, as folks are entering the meeting. I will call each witness and at the same time queue up the next person who's on deck so that you can be prepared. When it's your turn, staff will move you from attendee into the virtual witness seat. You'll have two minutes to speak. And for those of you who are uh, in the Zoom meeting, you will be able to see the Zoom timer in one of the Zoom tiles, as you can see now. If you're calling in, I will do my best to make sure you hear your 30 second and 10 second uh, reminders. Uh, you will then be moved back into the attendees gallery and we'll call up the next witness. And attendees, you're welcome to continue to watch the meeting via the attendees gallery, or you can close down Zoom and go to the YouTube page. Uh, but we recommend that you not do both of those for technical reasons. Um, it will get uh, garbled and confusing. Uh, as each of you are moved into the witness chair, um, I will welcome you with the following words. Thank you for being here. We will begin the timer when you start your remarks. I will give you a reminder at 30 seconds remaining and another at 10 seconds. Please try to wrap up your final remarks at that point. Go ahead whenever you are ready. And then the timer will start once we hear you begin your remarks. As I mentioned before, this is groundbreaking territory for us. We've never used this format for a public hearing before. <clears throat> but the urgency of this moment uh, asks us to chart new waters because regardless of this global pandemic, we must bring Vermonters together to hear and understand each other on these important issues. With that, I will thank you again for being with us today. And I will uh, welcome you to watch the next two hearings, which are going to happen on August 12th and August 16th. I will now call up the first witness Aileen Zwankowski of Hartford, and also ask that Alan Quackenbush of Duxbury be on call and ready to go second. So Aileen. Madam Chair, uh, uh, can I inquire uh, about the live stream? I looked on the GovOps page and I don't see the live stream there. Is it on judiciary or yes, is it, it maybe on, it is I, on judiciary. I believe it's linked on the judiciary page. 
Okay, great, thank you. So Aileen, thank you for being here. We'll begin the timer when you start your remarks. I will give you a reminder at 30 seconds and another at 10. And then we'll ask that you try to, to wrap up your final remarks. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. My name is Aileen Schwinkowski. I know it's an unusual kind of combination. Um, I'm from Hartford, Vermont. I'm the chair of Hartford Committee on Racial Equity and Inclusion. Uh -huh. And we have been in existence uh, approximately three and a half years. Um, we are concerned with how training does not happen within our state for our police officers, particularly in the area of the current anti-bias training. Um, it has been researched over several years, and we know that anti-bias training it doesn't last, it's not effective. And I would like consideration that should happen where officers are put into real life situations where stress and their emotions can enter and any training that they receive would automatically normally disappear. So that's my concern is what we're not providing our officers to be able to deal with communities that they may not accept as looking like them uh, or being part of their community because they function in a us versus them mentality. Therefore, something has to change. And anything that our committee can do to help, uh, we will, because we're a research arm, uh, we will do what we can and we have tons of documentation to be seconds. able to present. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, next up, we have Alan Quackenbush of Duxbury and on deck will be Jacqueline Posley of Burlington. And if Alan Quackenbush is not with us, we can go to Jacqueline Postley of Burlington. Hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline Posley and I do live here in Burlington. Um, thank you for listening to me today. Hope to have, or be able to get through about three and a half points. First and foremost, um, I lived I have lived prior to Burlington in very rural parts of Vermont, including Goshen and Londonderry. Um, and I can remember during those times attempting to file police reports or um, have access to reports that I've filed. And that's been extremely difficult for me in those more rural locations. So just being more open about how to file reports and how to access that information, whether it be for domestic violence or a car accident or whatever the case may be in those more rural areas is extremely difficult. There are no websites for those. Uh, police departments, some of them share police departments with other counties, and just as someone who is new not only to the state, but also to New England, that was very difficult for me. So if we could make more public access to filing reports um, and, and to those filed reports afterwards, I think it would really benefit um, populations, especially in more rural places. Um, body cameras. I know we have heard body cams 13 times over, but I think I would really like to stress that uh, we need to make it mandatory for the entire state. I get the sense um, that it will be left up to departments, and I think that that will be um, the ball dropped if we do that. So I would really like to stress making body cameras mandatory for all departments throughout the entire state. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to address the training as well that um, our officers go through. I'm not sure about specifics when it comes to, seconds. to what the curriculum actually looks like, but I do want to put an emphasis on um, proper language as we um, address diverse populations, whether it be BIPOC or trans or whatever the case may be, that language is extremely important and could really help de-escalate situations as we look uh, into the future. And then um, just addressing, I, as I advocate in the state of Vermont, I find it very difficult. People really fight me on the fact that these biases do exist. So addressing these statistics and these numbers that are very real and ensuring that our officers know that they're very real. I'll follow up via email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I appreciate you being with us. Um, now, uh, I think Zia DeSantis is not with us. So I will ask uh, Ryer Erickson uh, to come and 
um, you may begin and the timer will start when you begin your remarks. Ryer Erickson of St. Albans. It's not that. We had you for a moment. I'm going to ask staff in the background to, Okay. there now, we go. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank okay, you so I'm much. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ryder Erickson. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to address you today. I'm a founding member of Neighbors for a Safer St. Albans. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about SROs or school resource officers. Um, they provide very little benefit to students or teachers. They don't generally keep schools safer. There's no evidence other than anecdotal that SROs help anything other than increasing a community's positive view of police. The negative aspects on the other hand are quite clear. Schools with SROs on campus are more likely to arrest students for age appropriate behavior. These numbers become all the more disparate when broken down by minority status. Black, indigenous and children of color along with LGBTQIA identifying children and children with disabilities are far more likely to be arrested by SROs than their peers. A recent study found that black girls are nationally four times more likely to be arrested in school. And in Vermont, that number goes up to five times. One of the things you asked was for people of color to talk about how they want police to interact with their communities. But I don't really want police to interact with my community. I don't want community policing. I don't want police speaking to my kids, trying to play, basket, play basketball with them, et cetera. Police need to earn the public's trust before they get to do that. And it's not the responsibility of the community to trust the police. It's up to the police to gain the community's trust. And among people of color and other minority groups, they don't seem to have done that. Brings, this brings me back to SROs. Our children's job in school isn't to make police look good, as so many people in meetings I've sat through in the past few weeks have suggested. In yeah. fact, our children's only job is to learn. And it's our job to support them in that pursuit and allow them to feel safe. Consider the opinions of Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, the Human Rights Commission, the ACLU of Vermont, the NAACP, the Advancement Project, and other local and national organizations in doing something to remove law enforcement from our schools, especially from our elementary schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Um, I will now welcome up Catherine Brooks of Virgins, and after her will be Abby German of Montpelier. So welcome, Catherine. Your two minutes will start when you begin speaking. All right, I don't see Catherine Brooks of Virgins. How about Abby German of Montpelier? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for being with us today. You've got two minutes, go right ahead. In 1777, Vermont proved itself to be on the right side of history when it became the first state to abolish slavery. Systemic racism, unfortunately, was not abolished and is upheld in many of our institutions, including law enforcement. The police is a violent, anti-Black, colonial institution that originated as slave patrols. Their primary mandate is to protect not citizens, but property, and to militarily enforce white supremacist capitalism. When it comes to the national crisis in policing, Vermont is not an outlier. Black people are stopped and searched at disproportionate rates to white people. Our prisons have some of the worst racial disparities in the entire United States. Images of police brutality against people of color appear often, and the officers are never held accountable. This is despicable, and we must do everything in our power to stop the suppression and violence. It is my view that the police must be completely abolished, as well as abolishing prisons. Research shows that crime is a response to social conditions. So by defunding prisons and the police and redirecting that money into communities, violent crime is reduced and communities are uplifted. Possible solutions to societal problems, excluding police and prisons, include but are not limited to affordable housing, health care, employment, counseling, after-school programs, trauma services, and anti-violence programs. 
Now, in 2020, it is time for Vermont to prove itself to be on the right side of history yet again. It is time to take a stand against the prison industrial complex and the racist and violent police institution. We must abolish prisons and completely abolish the police, leading the nation in its fight for racial justice and equality. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you, Abby. Next, we have Matthew LaFleur, who I believe is, is joining us via phone. So Matthew, I'll do my best to give you a verbal 30 second and 10 second reminder. Um, and your two minutes will begin when you start talking. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, I will. Uh, uh, with me is, uh, we need to uh, address address more racial disparity racial disparity in Vermont because of uh, people with disabilities. You know, really are at the forefront of these seniors uh, and uh, basically the vulnerable population of Vermont. With me, for me, it's a uh, it's an issue, an issue. I lived here for 25 years in Vermont, and it's to me it's a very very uh, disturbing to see on a national level and on a local level that uh Police are not very held accountable for, for any police of Vermont. It's not held accountable for the actions they take. And to me, like, for me, it's like the police like to try to get away with some of this stuff, allegations and stuff, you know, for stuff that, you know what, that uh, is provably, uh, for me, uh, very uh, disheartening to hear. But I think we need to do, like, more education training and more mental health service professionals on the job with them, make sure that they're actually doing what the, that what they're supposed to be doing is to protect and serve the people, not for money. They should be liable for the stuff they've done and held responsible for it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for being with us today. Um, next, we have Monica Ivanchik of Burlington, and after her will be Jessica Laporte of Burlington. Go ahead, Monica. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Monica Ivancic, and I have lived in Burlington for the last six and a half years, moved to the state from Wisconsin. My daughter attends Hunt Middle School, um, and I'm on my second term serving on Burlington School Board, and I'm the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for the last two and a half years. Um, and my words today are my personal opinion, not those of the Burlington School Board. Um, it is high time that we take a deep look at police brutality and violence in the U.S., especially um, in Vermont, um, particularly towards our population of color, our black and brown people. Um, I would like to point out that on June 26th, there was a New York Times article on police training in Germany. Uh, there, they require two and a half years minimum training, including studies on law, ethics, and police history. While here in the US, in Georgia, it takes 11 weeks or six months in New York City. I'm not familiar how long this is in Vermont, but this is a deep concern of, for me, for someone who upholds the law um, in our country. Um, and uh, last but not least, I would really like to talk about police presence in our schools. Why do Americans feel that we need police in our schools um, to feel more safe? Um, mass shootings are highly planned events, and even in Parkland, Florida, the cop that was at the school was not anywhere near. So um, many of our students are traumatized by the sight of a cop, especially by having a weapon um, on them in the school. So we need to be considerate of these students and uh, think also about what other countries put police in their schools. Um, so uh, thank you for your time. Uh, in Burlington, we're making changes this fall that we're excited about. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for being with us, Monica. Next up, we have Jessica Laporte of Burlington and on deck is Hannah Sadek of Cavendish. Go ahead, Jessica.
Hi, this is Jessica Laporte. Um, I was born and raised here in Vermont, um, spent a good amount of time away and now have moved back and I'm living in the Burlington area. And I'm calling in today both to present a couple of ideas and um, items that I support that are being promoted through a number of racial equity groups across the state. Um, but also to, to state that, um, as was brought up at the beginning of the hearing, that police reform is only one piece of the puzzle. And I want to push our legislature to truly explore what equity means. And I, I am really encouraged by some of the new positions, both at state, um, at the state level and in cities like Burlington to have racial or equity and inclusion um, departments. And I truly believe that by funding those and by staffing those out, we can begin to imagine together a better future. Um, I, in terms of police reform, um, at the end of the day, none of the, uh, of the measures that we can take in terms of military grade equipment and techniques, um, involvement of police in incidents or um, issues like this, None of those can be effective if qualified immunity still stands. It shields law officials who abuse their power from meaningful accountability. And we have seen how even our lawmakers who want to hold police accountable are Pretty curbed bad. in their ability to do that um, because of a qualified immunity. I want the state legislature to consider strongly how we can curb the power of police labor unions who are effectively governing us rather than our representatives governing them. Um, so I just, I wanna encourage that headline that of qualified immunity needing to be challenged and removed in this state. Thank you, Jess, for being with us today. Um, next, we have Hannah Sadek of Cavendish and up after will be Steve Brewer of St. Albans. So Hannah, when you are ready, go ahead. All right, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you to the chair and committees for facilitating this space. My name is Hannah Sadek. I am 25 years old and I have lived in Vermont my entire life. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone that has and will share testimony today and at the two future public hearings. Lived experience at the hands of systems that were never designed to protect us can be an incredibly heavy burden to carry and share. When I was 11, my mother contested a, a ticket in court because the Vermont officer that gave her the ticket was racist and inappropriate in, in his behavior towards her. That stuck with me my entire life. I had been pulled over by sheriffs in my hometown, and one time, even after I gave him my license and registration, he continued to question where I was from. I've never felt safe or protected by Vermont law enforcement or while in the presence of Vermont law enforcement. This winter, I was driving a van with six white male passengers and I was pulled over. During the entire interaction with my hands placed visibly 10 and two on the steering wheel, I kept telling myself that if the officer did anything inappropriate and no one believed me, maybe they would believe six white male witnesses. I do not believe that incremental reforms demonstrate that the voices of those most harmed and vulnerable are being heard. Defunding with the goal of abol abolition is what will actually protect us because what I do know is that the presence of police has and will continue to harm black, brown, and indigenous community members and those who exist at the intersections of these and other oppressed identities. 30 seconds. And to the committees on government operations and on judiciary, if we must carry the burden of lived experience, the knowledge of our experiences and your action or inaction should weigh heavily on your conscience. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah for being with us. Uh, next up, we have Steve Brower from St. Albans, and after that, Ricky Rosati of Brattleboro, Ontastica. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you for okay, being with us. Sorry for the delay. Um, hello, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Steve Brown, I'm the Director of Behavioral Health at Northwest Counseling and Support Services. It's a, one, of the, one of the 10 designated mental health agencies serving Vermont. 
we serve Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Um, wanted to share in the last five years, we've been piloting um, a model working with the Vermont State Police here in St. Albans and also the mm -hmm. St. Albans City Police of embedding a, a crisis or a crisis clinician within uh, law enforcement themselves. Wanted to just share um, three points. One is to give you a sense of the kind of applications of the model, a recent example of a young of a youth or young adult um, on top of a building on its top edge who wanted to jump and the law enforcement officer on scene with our staff and the law enforcement officer actually de-escalating the situation very well, but our person on scene being able to help facilitate a plan and also avoiding a hospitalization because that's what not, the person didn't need. We've also seen some really good experiences with the sheriff and um, sheriff's office in terms of evictions with individuals who have mental health issues and trying to prevent those from escalating and being proactive. Um, we've also been able to see some really um, positive results of being on the scenes of tragedies such as suicides or even recently a homicide and making sure people on the scene get what they need and working together. In terms of the model, um, what we've learned over the last five years, four, um, four years in the state police and five years in the um, city police is that you have to work within each culture of each um, law enforcement agency. Um, we have a very similar model that we adapt um, and we also do some overlap with the sheriffs um, in the Swanton um, Police Department as we can. We found that having a provider dedicated to one location really accelerates the trust and connection with law enforcement and where they can work together and develop some meaningful connections. Ten seconds. Um, overall, one of the things that we've really learned too is the value of the Team 2 training model and being able to where law enforcement and mental health train together and learn how to have more collaborative responses together. Um, but overall, this is, we see some real positive um, ideas with this model and its application and expansion would be would be beneficial in, some, in addressing some of the issues. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, uh, Ricky Rosati is not with us. So next we will go to Reed Doyle of Burlington. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, representatives uh, and committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Reed Doyle. Uh, I had a case against the Burlington Police Department that went to the Supreme Court this past year um, relative to record, records inspection. The reality is, is that on June 17th of 2017, I witnessed five police officers come to Roosevelt Park in the old north end of Burlington. Um, when I arrived at the park, there was a tall officer who was arresting an African-American teenager and while the first teenager that I witnessed was getting arrested, there were a number of other kids that came to understand what was happening. In short, instead of de-escalating the situation, uh, a couple of officers came to a number of kids that were there. And before attempting to de-escalate, the woman officer quickly threatened to pepper spray the group if they did not comply and retreat from the area. Shortly thereafter, an officer threatened more than one child verbally and made a comment along the lines, you don't want to mess with me, and took it to a whole nother level by actually physically assaulting a young teenager and he, who was already retreating with his hands in the air. Although the child did not fall to the ground, it was a sturdy push in the chest that caused, <clears throat> that was uncalled for. Finally, only being five to 10 feet away from the incident, I did not feel, I did not feel unsafe, see any behavior that would have led me to believe that the officer's safety was at stake in any which way or form. Furthermore, I know a number of these kids and I understand that the police have had to respond to complaints involving some of these kids. After the threats and assaults, I approached the officer to understand uh, what, why they responded the way they did. And the reality is, is that the officer said that it really wasn't his problem that these kids came from a different socioeconomic issue, yet these are officers of the peace. The reality is, is that you have black children are being criminalized without good cause because officers escalate and arrest as the first resort instead of the last. Officers or community liaisons need to be trained on de-escalation, preventing implicit biases that lead them to escalate in particular with people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Reed, for being with us. Uh, next up, we have Joseph Coro of Fairfax, and after that will be Megan O'Leary. So Joseph, when you are ready. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, Joseph, go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Um, hello, and Bill 119.808 states the definition of imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury means when, based on the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe that a person has the present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or serious bodily injury to the law enforcement officer or another person. It's impossible for anyone to know what the intent of a person really is. Police officers are not mind readers. Right now, the three things that officers look for when deciding to use deadly force is ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. You cannot ask officers to determine, determine the intent of a person because they are not in their head. I ask that you remove intent and replace it with jeopardy. It also states that a law enforcement officer shall not use a prohibited restraint on any person for any reason. Please stop trying to write our laws while looking at Minneapolis. If you choose to leave this language without having an exception for deadly force situations, you will end up with, for example, an officer fighting for their life that cannot access their gun or anything else. Where they may have chosen to use a neck restraint in the past, they now can't. Instead, they choose to stab the person they are fighting with or hit them with a blunt object several times. Tell me which situation is worse. Which one do you think has the likelihood of an officer being able to render aid and save you? In Bill 808, it states, decision by law enforcement officer to use force shall be evaluated from perspectiveness perspective of reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances known to our known to or perceived by the officer at the time rather than with the benefit of hindsight the totality of the circumstances shall account for the occasions where officers may be forced to make quick judgments about using force the only thing i would say here is you should add some language stating the officer will be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation with the same amount of experience you cannot expect a four-year officer and then compare them to a 10 15 or 20 year officer the amount of experience is substantially different and officers may act differently due to the amount of experience. Please amend these bills and finalize them with the state of Vermont in mind. Do not look to California or Minneapolis. Look to the state we live in. Please do not finalize these bills with motions. Instead, finalize them with research and rational thinking. Please do not tie the hands of police officers by passing laws that will cause them to not be able to do their job safely and in turn not be able to keep the citizens of Vermont safe. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Next up, we have Megan O'Leary of Burlington. And after that, we will have Todd LaCroix of Burlington. Go ahead, Megan. Is Megan O'Leary with us? Can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Megan. Sorry about that, thank you for having me. Public safety should not be placed at risk to save, at risk to save money or to politically grandstand. Any divestment from law enforcement should only happen when another entity is tried, tested, and ready to take on the responsibilities. It is irresponsible and reckless to try and improve public safety, reduce criminal justice spending, and reinvest savings in strategies that can decrease crime and reduce recidivism at the same time. Decisions need to be informed and based on research as opposed to being made rashly as a reaction to national events during election year, which is basically what S219 does. Policies that are enacted need to be funded. For example, S29 states, it is the intent of the General Assembly that law enforcement use de-escalation strategies first and foremost for using force in every community police interaction. De-escalation is more than a buzzword. It is a labor-intensive strategy that requires a lot of resources, training, and personnel. It needs to be recognized and treated as such before writing it into laws. This law requires that police de-escalate every situation, but makes no provisions to fund training or provide resources. It also does not recognize not every situation can be de-escalated, nor should it. Examples of this would be an active shooter situation, in-progress serious assaults, I yield the rest of my time for the 152 officers that were killed in the line of duty. This is a 63% increase from the same time last year. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, next, we have Todd LaCroix um, of Burlington. And after Todd will be Tomas Jankowski of Newport. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you for being with us. My name is Todd LaCroix, 
I once was a respected person in Burlington until the Burlington Police Department showed up and destroyed my life and my home. Now, I was the only person, I, I guess, to get out of Waterbury in five days because it was such a clear-cut case of abuse, of police brutality. Except the problem is, is that Vermont didn't care. None of you cared. And so for the last nine years, I've been dehumanized for my abuse, surviving it, okay? And every time I have attempted to try to get justice, Nobody cares. This is pandering, all right? If you really want to change something, start having the real conversation. Because what's going on, the problem, is related to the militarization of our culture. Not just our police, our culture. Our schools are militarized. Our police are militarized. It is the militarization that is the problem. I was so moved and disturbed by the police violence that I had experienced in my own community. I once made a movie with the Burlington police. I praised them as one of the best p community police in the, in, the, in the country. And I lived in ghettos. I lived in Pompano Beach in Fort Lauderdale. Okay? I had seen real racist police. And I was disturbed, okay, at how the military had just overrun Burlington. And I started Occupy Wall Street. And let me tell you, you're not having a real conversation about the real criminals, the ones without badges, running around without badges, but causing trouble in our communities, the provocateurs, the undercovers. These people pillage, rape, Second. they are drug dealers, and you don't audit them, you don't oversee them, they steal people's intellectual property, and then they ruin lives to defend themselves against being known for their crime. Time I would time. like Thank you, you Mr. DeProy. I do something. I would welcome you to uh, submit any other comments in writing if you uh, have other ideas that you'd like to share with us. Uh, next up is Tomas Jankowski of Newport. Tomas, are you with us? Madam Chair, he's been moved over and unmuted, um, mm -hmm. but isn't responding. I don't see him. We'll give another moment to see if he is able to respond. I see him in the panelist list, but um, perhaps he has walked away from his computer. Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Jankowski is the last uh, witness on our list today. And so we will wait a moment and uh, and see if Mr. Jankowski um, responds to his call to testify. Mr. Jankowski, we are ready for you to share your thoughts with us. Tomas Jankowski of Newport, are you there? All right, um, that is it for um, 
attendees here for today. And um, so thank you all for being with us. Representative Grad, do you have any, uh, any thoughts that you would like to send us off with um, before we close this public hearing? Uh, no, I just wanna thank everybody for, uh, for participating. And again, please feel free to send us your testimony or any other thoughts and uh, thank committee members and staff very much uh, for joining us and uh, especially staff uh, for a lot of work to making making this happen so thank you everybody yes yeah, so please um, uh, members of the public as well as um, legislators who are here with us please encourage folks to sign up to participate on august 12th or the 16th um, we have had some tremendous staff support here in the background to make this uh, public hearing possible, and uh, it's a learning process. So we will um, we will take what works today and and use it again for the 12th and the 16th, and and see if we can smooth out some of the wrinkles. So thank you so much for being with us today.